Okay, so we're going to give you a brief overview of the GFA program. Um, what is GFA? GFA is a state authority founded in 1985. Um, GFA's mission is to conserve and protect Georgia's energy, land, and water resources. Uh, GFA has provided um, more than $4.3 billion since um, its inception in 1985. GFA has funded approximately 1,600 projects. Next. All right, so we have um, our loan programs. We have the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, which is a federally funded program that deals with drinking water. Um, we have the Clean Water um, State Revolving Fund, which deals with our sewer um, system water. We also have our Georgia Fund, which is for, it's our state funded um, program that gives the ability to emergency projects, economic development projects, um, and things of that nature, um, some water conservation. We also had some land conservation projects that were funded under the Georgia Fund as well. Uh, eligible borrowers, counties and municipalities, local water, and sewer and sanitary districts, state and local authorities, uh, boards and political subdivisions created by the General Assembly. Next. So um, this is one of the major things that I think most municipalities or most loan recipients want to look at as far as what uh, is important to them is saving money. And we give low interest rate loans for long-term financing. So for the Georgia Fund, our rate for a 20-year, um, and you can get up to three million max, is 2.44%. Um, for the drinking water, uh, you can get 1.94% at 20 years. At, for a, a maximum of total of 25 million, you can ask up to 25 million per project. So that's, that's a significant amount. Um, we also have the Clean Water uh, State Revolving Fund, which is the same rate, 1.94% uh, for 20 years. And the maximum amount you can ask for is 25 million. We've seen projects where uh, communities have asked for, they've had different phases, so they needed more than 25 million, so they've asked for 25 in one cycle, and then they would got, come back the next cycle and ask for another 25 million. One of the uh, communities is the city of Atlanta, of course. Uh, they have a large infrastructure, and they've um, asked for a lot of money. Um, I've also dealt with Clayton County and uh, Clayton County currently has a project that's about $27 million uh, that they're uh, um, doing upgrades to their uh, sewer system. So, um, But these rates um, are very low rates, and they're very good for, um, you know, long term. Um, so you can up to 30 years for the drinking water and clean water, maybe up to 40 if, if um, on the clean water. Um, and these rates are only our standard rates. Yeah. If you become water first, yeah. you get a whole 1% reduction. Yeah. So, that, of course, I'm sure that's what drew you yeah. into this yeah. <laughs> program. Yeah. So these are the standard rates. And so with that, with these being the standard rates, it gives us the ability to give low interest loans already before we even go into um, the benefits of being water first. So next slide. All right, so we have our conservation is, uh, initiative. We have water conservation, which deals with utility water loss, uh, end of use, uh, efficiency, and conservation. These are projects like uh, where you have I&I &I, uh, projects where inflow and infiltration projects where you can have um, pipes that are just aging and they've just had issues, and so you want to conserve water um, by, you know, um, dealing with taking away any of the problems that they may have as far as losing water um, with uh, in the life of pipes. Um, you have energy conservation, which is energy production, energy conservation, energy management planning, um, land conservation, where you can also purchase land, purchase land um, that you want to conserve for green space or different things of that nature. So you, we, we also provide funds for that as well. Um, next slide. 
So we're going to get into the water first aspect of um, where we are. Water first program, water first communities, uh, work with local and state partners to increase the quality and through life, the wise management and protection for water resources. Uh, we take a proactive approach. We want communities to be able to go above and beyond what are the natural um, or what are the regulatory standards that are given by the state. So if you want to be water first um, designated, we want you to go not only just handle and take care of your responsibilities as regulatory standards, but we want you to go above and beyond um, what is given by our, our state so that you could be deemed as a water first uh, community. Um, pursue environmental excellence beyond what is required by law. Protect value of the water resources for bo both environmental and economic benefits today and for future generations. We know that water just don't affect us right now where we are, but the decisions that we make today will directly affect the decisions of tomorrow. So we want to make sure that we're doing everything possible to be good watership, uh, water stewards of um, everything that has been entrusted to us from community standpoints. And we know that everyone is connected throughout the state of Georgia. We might have a water source in one part of the, the state, but it directly still affects everybody because we're all interconnected in, in water. Next slide. Financial incentives. 1% um, interest rate reduction, uh, so those rates that you saw, 2.44%, uh, you know, 1.94% for the clean water and drinking water, and 2.44% for the Georgia fund, that would drop a 1%, so it would go to 1.44 or 0.94%, which is a significant amount uh, when you're talking about loans that have a life of 20 to 30 years, you're talking about uh, a huge savings um, in that 1% reduction. Also, annual eligibility for DCA block development uh, grants for water-related projects, and also uh, priority in the EPD um, 319 grant funding, uh, which gives a lot of technical assistance to really uh, uh, disadvantaged communities that need the technical assist uh, assistance that they need to be able to uh, manage, um, you know, even doing rate structures and things of that nature. Sometimes that they don't always have the money to pay for up front, and uh, the 319 grant uh, funding can give assistance to that. Uh, other benefits statewide recognition, including signage and authorization to use the Water First logo. Um, also, free attendance to these Water First workshops. Um, so that's, these are other uh, incentives. And our biggest thing is we want to make sure that we give most of the communities that are mm -hmm. seeking water first designation the opportunity where we can go and we can talk to the communities up front to help them get to the place of where they could become water first designated. Um, we're still learning. We're still growing. We're still, um, uh, if, if those who may, may have known uh, Deidre, uh, Danian, she's worked in the Water First program for 11 years before um, moving away from, uh, well, yeah, moving to, I think she's working now for the city of Thunderbolt. Um, but she's working for the city of Thunderbolt now, but we still have to call her periodically because she has so much uh, intellectual property and so much knowledge that we still try to get you know, in contact with her at, at different points in time. But our biggest thing is trying to help as many communities as possible become water first designated. So um, water first savings on GIFA loans. Now if you look at Griffin, they had $8 million over 20 years um, and the total interest rate at the normal interest rate was 1.94 million uh, total interest at the water first interest rate was 1 million for 1.04 million, which was a saving of $900,000 over that uh, 20 year span. Newton County <laughs> uh, had 25 million over 30 years. So at the normal interest rate, it was 12.6 million. Um, and then interest, water first interest rate was 7.95 uh, million, which was a 4.65 million 
dollar savings over their 30 years. So when you see that interest rate reduction, that is a major, major savings to the communities um, by even being water first designated. So you can see the, the vast uh, savings that are giving but just by that 1% reduction. Next up. So uh, the components of water first, um, we have watershed assessment. Uh, everyone knows that they live uh, in a watershed. Everyone knows that they live in a watershed. Uh, so we have watershed assessment. We have stormwater master planning, um, wastewater treatment and management, um, water supply planning, water supply protection, water conservation, water reclaim and reuse, educational outreach, and regional planning, regional water planning. So these are the nine components of the Water First uh, program, and all of these nine parts are part of the Water First checklist. So we want to see if communities are, you know, somewhere in between trying to follow ways in which they can go above and beyond state regulations in these nine categories to become Water First designated. Next slide. So watershed uh, assessment, EPD's definition, uh, a comprehensive effort to determine the multiple causes of water quality and habitat de degradation in a watershed. Um, ways to exceed state uh, requirements, larger buffer requirements for streams and water supply sources. So we know that there are buffer uh, variances uh, that you have where you have some level of body of water and you want to make sure that you have enough rested vegetation between your, where you're going to disturb the area and where the actual uh, water um, source is. So larger buffer requirements, and you can go above, I think, um, what the current is, uh, is it 25 or? It depends on the It depends on the area, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, larger buffer requirements for streams and water supply sources number of water quality sampling sites, a large um, use, land use and zoning regulations to mitigate um, watershed impacts, open space provisions, impervious surface limitation, um, green infrastructure requirements, and tree ordinances. And so all of these are ways that you can exceed requirements um, that are you know, already the regulatory standards from the state. And these are just some ideas of where, where you can say, how can I improve in the areas of where we are um, that can go above and beyond what we're currently doing right now? And so these are some areas of where we can give some guidance and direction to help you even uh, become, you know, go above and beyond um, the state regulations. Next slide. Stormwater master plan, a management plan, uh, even if a community is not required, to have a stormwater permit, water first applicants should start implementing um, minimum measures of NPDES phase one or phase two programs. Uh, examples, uh, litter control ordinance or illicit discharge or detention ordinances. Uh, we also have stormwater inventory, digital maps of stormwater infrastructure are ne necessary. Uh, photo inventory is helpful for determining problems, debris, erosion, and et cetera. So you want to make sure that you're doing everything possible from a stormwater survey to make sure that you are properly surveying your area uh, of understanding where your pipes are, uh, whether that is GIS mapping or anything like that. You want to make sure that you, you have a good uh, working knowledge of your system, of your system. Uh, stormwater utilities, um, consider and dedicate funding stream for stormwater projects. All right, next slide. So GPS stormwater inventory, you see these are some bad examples of what's, what could happen uh, when you're not properly uh, evaluating your stormwater. Um, you see these are what not to do um, when you're looking at a stormwater inventory. But when you're taking inventory, you're looking around and you're trying to make sure that the areas that you're looking at are, are actually beneficial for your community and not gonna be uh, detrimental. So you, you don't want things like this happening. Um, next slide. All right, wastewater treatment management. 
<coughs> wastewater planning, short-term capital improvement program. So you want to make sure that you have not only a short-term um, view of what you need to do that is going to be uh, going to improve capital for your uh, program. You want to also have a long-term master plan based on expected growth. So these things, not only you're looking at it from a short-term perspective, but you're also looking at ways and ideas that are going to be beneficial to uh, your community over a long period of time because you don't want to just make decisions on the here and now, but you want to make sure that you're doing everything possible that's going to be beneficial for your community for many, many, many years to come. Um, ongoing operations, policy for new development to tie in to um, sewer system. Um, we know that when you have residents that are coming or, or you have even developers that are coming to the area that are you know, looking for ways to um, increase uh, the residential space, um, they also just don't need to be there without having the proper um, infrastructure to be able for those things to come. And even if, when you're looking at new businesses, you want to make sure that you have a policy for new development to tie into the sewer system. Um, a policy for minimum lot size for residential septic systems. Um, inflow, infiltration, detection uh, for, uh, for uh, program. We also have education on septic tank maintenance. Now, from a personal standpoint, my brother, he lives in San Antonio. And so I go to San Antonio often, and he's not on city um, sewer system, so he has a septic tank. Well, a couple of times while I've been there, he's had to have uh, companies come out and, you know, uh, do maintenance on his septic system. Um, and then there are certain things that he has to do as far as uh, even with, you know, not flushing certain things down the toilet or anything. So you want to make sure that there are proper ways in order to maintain a septic uh, system. And uh, he's been hoping that the city will come to that area so that he can get on um, with uh, the city. But right now he has to deal with what he has. And, and I've also had a coworker who actually just recently bought a house who said they were actually on city uh, sewer, but when they did more investigation, they found out that it was a septic uh, tank and he's not happy. Um, so the, but so, these are some of the things that we have to really think about when we're, we're looking at um, making sure that we maintain. Uh, that's extra work that I think he didn't want to put into um, doing, um, having a septic system, um, then being on um, the city's um, sewer system. Um, but also education on fats, oils, and grease. Um, I pastor a church, and because I pastor a church, um, we have a kitchen that we use a lot throughout the year, and we have a grease trap, and we have to make sure that that is properly disposed of and different things of that nature. And, um, and so I didn't really understand a lot of that until we had to actually take our grease trap out and how much, um, you know, that's just a whole nother, <laughs> a whole nother thing that, that it just blew my mind. But the more you begin to really learn and see all of the things that we do that directly affect um, our communities in different ways, we definitely need to make sure that we're doing everything possible. So education on fats, oils, and grease um, are, are other ways that you can deal with wastewater treatment and management. Next slide. Water supply planning, short-term and long-term plans, uh, conduct assess uh, asset management planning to determine short-term and long-term investments. Investments. So you want to make sure that you're properly looking at your debt service coverage. You want to see uh, where you are, even in your rate structure, are your rates um, at a uh, proper um, uh, amount. That, will, that can be beneficial for generating revenue for your community. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you're doing um, asset management planning to determine short-term and long-term investments. Work closely with planning departments uh, to ensure adequate infrastructure for future growth areas. Uh, I was talking with um, the drinking water 
uh, EPD and a lot of times when you're putting in new wells you also have to make sure that there is water that enough water to be able to service the, the area that you're trying where that growth may be coming and so if you're going to put a new well or if you're putting anything that's going to deal with the whole water system infrastructure you want to make sure that you have the you know ample amount of resources to be able to um, service your community. I may be preaching to the choir, but you know, these are things that we have to look at. Um, also consider interconnections with other systems for resiliency. Now if anyone knows that resiliency is when um, you may have a natural disaster or anything that may take place and your system may go down. So how resilient is your system in, in, in other words of how you're able to get back on track as soon as possible. And then also having the ability to try to mitigate as many problems as possible when natural uh, disasters may come your way. And we can't stop Mother Nature, Mother Nature so we try to plan and be uh, in a position to prepare ourselves for when those uh, things may happen. All right, water supply protection, common tools for water supply protection, source water protection plans, maps of system components, location of shutoff valves need to be known in cases of what? Contamination, uh, plant security equipment, lab testing equipment, um, SCADA, um, data management. So we know the SCADA system um, has a way of where you can, um, you can have a, data acquisition for your whole water system. You can actually see and turn on valves, turn on valves when you need to from an electronic system without having to go manually and turn those systems off. So uh, having a SCADA system is important too. And uh, we also give, I think, uh, incentives for SCADA system if I'm not, not mistaken. But also uh, consumer confidence report with information on how customers can be involved in the watershed protection efforts. The more information that we give, um, you know, our residents on sharing as much information as possible, the better we can because if our residents are educated, then they will know some things that they should and should not do to help, you know, your, your water system or your sewer system be as uh, efficient as possible. And the more education that you can give, uh, whether it's pamphlets or whether having different town hall meetings or different ways to educate your community, the residents, is going to be beneficial for your water system. Next, water conservation. Uh, key conservation activities, meter change out program. We've been seeing so many meter change out programs all throughout the state of Georgia and um, this is very, very key and critical. A lot of times the water meters, you don't know how much water you're losing until you change out uh, a bad meter and put in a good meter and see the significant um, water savings that you had and, or water loss that you prior, prior you might have had uh, prior. And um, having um, water meter change out, water loss audits, a uh, water rate structure that encourages conservation, all of these things are ways that you can conserve water, water conservation, educational strategy. Um, green buildings, water-wise landscaping, irrigation requirements such as wastewater law. Um, you know, you can have water ordinances where you can't, you know, um, sp use sprinklers at certain times. Um, you want to even have um, ways of doing toilet rebates where you can have water efficiency, water efficient toilets. Um, I mean, there are so many ideas out there that can help. Um, you know, be beneficial for water conservation. Um, and then with the building software now and with the technology of the, you know, advanced metering infrastructure, you have ways where you can even, you know, uh, see what's going on in a person's house by just knowing uh, the water, how much water uses they may use on a regular basis. And if they notice that there's an uptick in water con uh, consumption, they can kind of give you a, you can call your, your billing um, crew and, and say, hey, you know, I noticed my water bill is up, you know, um, or they can call you and tell you, hey, you're using more water uh, right now and, and try to give you um, some level of uh, update on what, what could be going on. You may have a leak somewhere. So, um, you know, these are ways that uh, water conservation can really be um, instrumental and beneficial 
not only to the community, but also to the residents in which the community is serving. All right, next slide. So rate structure. So uh, University of North Carolina uh, Environmental um, Finance Center came up with a dashboard, and they've been working with G for, for many years now with the dashboard. And this dashboard gives you the ability to do bill uh, comparisons with communities that are close in size with uh, your community. So you could do uh, bill comparisons. Uh, we, we look at the conservation signal and what it says, the water price per thousand gallons after uh, 10,000 gallons uh, median. So you can look at cost recovery, median affordability. Uh, all of these can give you um, ways in which you can have an uh, a understanding of how you um, compare to communities that are, you know, um, similar to yours in population or, you know, um, in size. So this gives the water rate structure, it helps um, you have an opportunity to kind of like compare yourself and look at where you are if you need to increase your rates, you know, um, probably won't need to decrease because you don't want to lose revenue. So you may need to increase your rates um, if a community that is your same size, but their rate structure may be a little bit higher than yours and they're generating a little more revenue. But of course, you have to go through the proper channels, and we all know that when you're going through the proper channels, you got to do, you got to get city government involved, and get council and all of those involved. And a lot of times, you're having public meetings, and you're getting involved with your residents, and you're hearing what your residents are thinking um, as it relates to increasing rates. So, um, all of that makes a big part of the process. But uh, a lot of times, communities really need to raise their rates but they don't know how to properly go about, um, you know, making that happen without, you know, causing a, a, a commotion with their community. So, uh, so, but at least you have an opportunity to see, you know, where you stand um, in the grand scheme of things with um, other communities that are like yours. Next, water reclamation and reuse. Reclaimed water is highly treated wastewater um, that can be used again safely for other purposes. So study cost effectiveness of implementation, uh, examples of um, golf course uh, irrigation. Also we have spray fields, uh, ways you can reuse water. Um, so try to find ways in where you can reuse, you know, the water that has been treated already to still benefit your community in ways um, that are going to be beneficial. So. Education and outreach, um, ways to educate, website, governmental channel, uh, libraries, uh, welcome packets when there are new tie-ins to the system, um, bill inserts, videos, um, you know, so there are many ways that anytime a new resident comes to, you know, your area, the welcome packet would be good to give them uh, understanding of what you know what it means to be a part of your community and what are some you know limitations or expectations that are needed for each resident when they come and be a part of your community so um, but as much as we possibly can and as much as you possibly can as a community try to educate your residents as much as possible that that's going to be beneficial um, to the life of your water system um, also when to educate always uh, especially before rate increases or new fees. <laughs> uh, this is really important to make sure uh, they won't, there won't be a pushback in what we were just talking about. Um, next slide. Regional water planning. Uh, we said earlier that everyone is connected in some way. So we have different regions. You have um, the coastal um, North Georgia, uh, Metro North Georgia water planning district, Savannah Upper, uh, Ogeechee, uh, Upper Oconee, Middle Okmulgee, um, trying to pronounce it right, uh, Middle Chattahoochee, Upper Flint, uh, Coastal Georgia, Awesome, Awesome, Maha, Swanee, uh, Satilla, and Lower Flint, um, Oklockney. <laughs> <laughs> but these are the different, uh, re, you know, regions, and, and you, you, it's good to get with um, that region where you are, 
to try to have plans that are going to be beneficial for that entire region and your community directly affects what happens in that region so you want to definitely make sure that you're having an opportunity to, to plan from a regional standpoint um, go ahead one thing to add on that is um, coming up this January and February several of these regional councils will be having um, stakeholder meetings and really trying to get utilities involved and um, want to hear from each of you and how you're contributing overall to the regional plan um, so try to be involved in those meetings that really looks good from a water first standpoint mm -hmm. Teresa North Georgia is actually having a meeting tomorrow I'm oh a, I'm okay the council member for great the Texas region yeah and they're having a meeting in Dawsonville okay in yeah no that's great thank you <laughs> So, uh, that's, yeah, <laughs> all right. So we're going to turn it over to Ansley. <laughs> all right. Hey, everyone. Um, so as I said earlier, oh, actually, skip that. Um, I'm going to try to fill in for Brent Keller on stormwater utilities. I know he is the expert, but I think... I think I was able to pull together some good information for you all, so hopefully this will be helpful. Um, first of all, let's just talk about, in general, how do you fund a stormwater project? There's so many different ways to do it. Um, one thing that we offer at GFA, you can get the Clean Water State Revolving Fund for any non-point source projects. Um, a lot of times people are challenged by how to fund a stormwater project though because they don't know what the repayment source for a loan would be. And that's where a stormwater utility comes in. Some of these other options are um, different ways that communities have gone about it, but stormwater utilities are what is gonna be the focus of this presentation. So a stormwater utility is a dedicated stream of funding and it's more stable and equitable than, say, a tax levy. Um, because you know what um, money will be coming in generally, um, you're more able to assess um, your needs and devote money to those projects on a yearly basis. Um, I'll get more into later on um, different ways that communities calculate their stormwater utility fees, but generally, it's a way to kind of spread the cost among um, the entire watershed, who is contributing to um, stormwater um, concerns such as um, more runoff. So it's more equitable because uh, develop a property that has more impervious <coughs> surface will be paying more to the stormwater utility fund. And um, we'll also go into what kinds of credits um, are offered with stormwater utilities. Um, typically, that is a key piece of the ordinance because um, in order to make the stormwater utility legally defensible, you have to have some type of credit to offer um, for good behavior, generally. Um, so I pulled together some interesting data about stormwater utilities. Um, there are about 1,600 in the country right now and 50, <coughs> 59 in Georgia. Don't know, this survey is from 2017, so that number is probably growing. Um, on. Um, it's just another graph to demonstrate how um, the popularity of stormwater utilities um, has really been growing over the last decade. Um, and this was really interesting. So a breakdown of um, when stormwater utilities were, were adopted in the southeast. If you look all the way in 1992, the very first stormwater utility was Griffin, Georgia. Um, so that's Brent Keller, who was going to be here today, uh, was going to be sharing all about that experience. So like I said, I will definitely get you guys in contact with him if you have questions, because he really he's the person to ask anything about a stormwater utility. Um, so similarly to what Oshabar shared earlier with the rates dashboard, what people might not know is that there's also a stormwater rates dashboard for stormwater utilities in the state. Um, so 
this is a really good tool to go look at the, the range of what rates are charged for stormwater. And just another point to show that this is a really key thing to consider if you're going for water first is about half of our water first communities do have a stormwater utility. So in Georgia, um, about 38% of Georgia's total population is served by a stormwater utility. And the utilities that have them um, generally serve between 10 and 50,000, but it's a range of course. And a lot of this data is was able to um, be provided by the UNC Eves Environmental Finance Center. Um, this was also just an interesting breakdown. <coughs> just, I don't know why the trend is this way, but more um, phase two communities for MPDES have stormwater utilities, but it's, it's almost equal. Phase one is getting there as well. Um, so stormwater, utility fees, they can be structured in all kinds of ways, similar to how your water and wastewater rates are structured. You can do a flat fee. Um, that's most common for residential. Um, sometimes a single family home is just charged a certain fee per month and um, they can always expect to see that same fee. Um, there's tiered flat fees, which can be based on different land uses. And then the um, per equivalent residential unit method, which I'll show you a breakdown of one of our water first communities that has that method um, in a minute. There's also several different ways to go about collecting the stormwater fees. Some people put it right on the utility bill with water and wastewater charges. Um, some people put it on the property tax bill. Um, that could be a strong enforcement method because you know if people don't pay that um, portion you can have a tax levy and that it can be a strong way to make sure that people are doing that and I have another um, slide in a minute that shows you what the uh, typical collection rate is per each of these methods so it's pretty interesting um, on the property tax bill it's as high as 96 percent for the utility bill, it's also very high, 94%. Now the standalone bill actually was shown to have the lowest um, collection rate, and that may just be a fact of people not understanding what this extra bill is and thinking that they don't need to pay it. Um, so with a stormwater utility, there's a whole education component that needs to come along with it um, to make sure your citizens understand that they're contributing to the stormwater um, needs in the community, so it's something that everybody should be paying into. Um, so based on the dashboard I showed earlier from EFC, these are the averages or median um, rates that have been uh, charged for stormwater utilities in Georgia. Um, so they're shown at different um, portions of property size and it's referring to how much square feet of impervious surface is on that site. So these um, 4.31 for residential and 13.77 for non-residential at those um, square footages. Um, so like I said earlier, I would go into um, how one of the Water First communities um, has done their breakdown. So City of Richmond Hill has a really good illustration here. Um, this shows you um, how much runoff is going to be um, contributed to by this property. So it shows you based on the size of the rooftop, the driveway, the sidewalk, that's how they calculate what they consider their equivalent residential unit. And once you set what your equivalent re residential unit is, that is what you charge per ERU. So 4.75 would then be multiplied by however many ERUs are, tip that's typically on a non-residential property is what, um, when they're using the ERU method for single, or sorry, this is the single family. <coughs> and then the next slide. Uh, is the non-single family. So you see here, 
they had to calculate um, the total impervious area and multiply or divide, find out how many ERUs are in the whole property, multiply it by the rate per ERU to get their total fee per month. Next slide. And like I said earlier, the credit um, system was basically offering a discount on a stormwater utility is really key to make sure that the stormwater utility is legally defensible. Um, that's with the legislation on how to do a stormwater ordinance, it's very important um, to make sure that you can do, um, do this. So what many communities offer is a discount for um, different types of properties that when they're developed, they put in a best management practice that um, is reviewed by the stormwater division and determined to um, you know, have the benefit of slowing down or capturing the rate of runoff um, from the site. And so uh, on the next slide, this shows you a breakdown of how many communities have the credit program in the state. And like I said, it's, it's very high because they want to make sure that these ordinances will be defensible. Um, so like we looked at before with ERUs, um, the way to calculate how much you would get on a credit would be to do the standard calculation of the impervious area um, on the site, but then you're also calculating um, how much the detention pond is the BMP that was selected here. So you're looking at how much that would reduce the runoff and multiply that by your, um, your standard fee to determine what your reduced bill would be. Um, so like a detention pond, um, some other options, this is a bioswale, um, there are many types of green infrastructure that communities can consider. Um, now on a more innovative note, we've seen some communities have um, credits for offering water resources education. Um, the Douglas, Douglasville, um, sorry, the Douglasville, Douglas County Water and Sewer Authority, they have a stormwater utility that actually offers credits for um, septic tank maintenance. So there's all kinds of things that you can consider when putting together these ordinances and figuring out um, how you would do the discount and structuring it to suit your community's needs. Um, so when, when determining whether to do a stormwater utility, you first do a feasibility study, um, both assessing your backlog of needs and also projecting out what kinds of needs you're expecting in future years. You would decide on a <coughs> billing method, whether it can be added to the utility bill, the property tax bill, or whether you want to go the standalone route. Um, always, always educate your citizens. Very important to keep them um, in mind because like with raising water and sewer rates, there's going to be pushback. So it's best to keep them um, aware of what's going on very early so that they can understand what is this new bill I'm paying. They need to understand that this is something that um, they're contributing to. So if they want... <laughs> They need this um, to help the community. Um, looking at the different credit examples, you can also exempt certain types of properties. Um, it's very common, you know, for a nonprofit owned, like a park or community center, something like that to be exempt. Um, so look at what makes sense for your community. And then the last note I have here is once you've established your fund, always go back and review it. Make sure it's bringing in sufficient revenue. Um, something I thought was pretty cool, I learned that the city of Dunwoody, they have in their ordinance um, that the rate is going to increase with inflation. So they have it tied to the consumer price index. That way they actually don't have to 
go back to their city council each time they want to raise their rate. It just increases each year with inflation. Um, they also mentioned that they had studied um, different indexes. You could use the municipal cost index, the construction cost index. There's all kinds of options. Um, it's a really cool method of making sure that you're bringing in enough revenues and you know, making sure it kind of stays out of the political sphere if you do it that way. Um, there won't be as much pushback from citizens if it's, oh, well, we have to do this. It's tied to inflation, you know? So it's just a very interesting way to look at bringing in sufficient revenue to s service your stormwater program. Um, and that's all I have for you on stormwater utilities. Um, we'll definitely discuss where you all are at later on and kind of um, see what else we can do to um, get you more resources on that. I apologize uh, that Brant wasn't here again, but I hope that was a good little overview.